Luke chapter number 18, verse number 1, and it reads, Luke 18, verse number 1. It's on the screens if you don't have your Bible. Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought to always, ought to always pray. Luke says, do not lose heart, saying there was a certain man who was a city judge, Jesus is given this parable, who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city. She came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God, this is the judge talking, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest she continue come and wear me out. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out to him day and night, through he, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth. Father, breathe life to this passage that you hear as we bless by reading and teaching of thine holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I wrestled with a couple titles. I wanted to call this um, Swinging at God. But then I figured some of you would misinterpret that text and say, man, pastor said swing on God. Then I called it Boxing with God because it was a little softer than Swinging on God. But the reality of this text is that the Greek word that is used, she wears me out, is talking about boxing. It's talking about punching underneath the left eye. So the illustration that Jesus gave is the woman was swinging on the judge, hence the judge being a type and metaphor. God saying if, if the judge would be this way, how much would God be? But have you ever been to a, an event and uh, you ate somebody's food and it, you just knew something was missing? You, you knew like, I don't know if it's what flavor it is. I don't know, some of y'all at 11, 15, you might be able to relate. You, you go to a restaurant and you so, uh, what's the word? Not bougie, but you just so, uh, just so hood a little bit. That's the word. So you, you bring a little seasoned salt in your purse just to make sure that the food is right because you know some restaurants don't do it the way that you like. And you just know something is missing. And, and this text kind of highlights that, that you could have a lot of things going, but there's one thing that you should have consistently, which is not just men as in a man, but mankind ought to always pray. And he says to them, there's a widow woman. Out of all types of people that Jesus could have used to describe this relationship with prayer, he uses a widow because in that context, a widow was someone that wasn't respected. A widow was someone that wasn't looked at as somebody. A widow was, was the least in the social class. And, and it's even weird that a woman is talking to Jesus or a judge because if a widow was talking to a judge, you need a man to do it. But because she didn't have any uncles, she didn't have any brothers, she didn't have any uh, siblings to stand in the stead, she had to do it herself. She was taken advantage of. And she's a widow, the, the least like. So God is simply saying, if you're saying, well, I can't talk to God because I got a record, God's like, but I used a widow. Y'all got to talk back to me 11 o'clock. It's 11.15. Y'all had enough time to sleep. So, so I give 9.15 a pass. Y'all don't get no pass. Somebody say amen. So, so, so as a widow, you, 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 you have an opportunity to have a relationship with me because I could have used a priest, but I knew you'd say, I expect priests to do that. But I use the widow to show you, you could be from Lake Mary to Lake Man, and I still want to hear from you. 
There, there's no juxtaposition between the one with the master's degree or the one that barely got a GED. I want to hear from you. And here's something that's interesting. Life has been bad for this widow because imagine you getting married and you losing your spouse and the death of your spouse in that community meant the death of your income too. So now I'm not only crying because I lost my spouse, but, but now we don't know how long they've been married. Maybe they've been married 10 years. Maybe they've been married for a year. We don't know. But, but she has to deal with the emptiness of knowing I ain't got a man to fend for me. I don't got a man to defend me. And in this society that they lived in, it was pretty crooked that women didn't get some type of treatment. It says in Isaiah that you're supposed to defend the poor. You're supposed to look after them. But this judge was rude, he was crude, and he, was, he would make his money from the temple treasury. That's how judges got paid. And they use an Aramaic word for the word judge. One letter over means robber. So the judges were known to be crooked. So now all of a sudden, the place that you're supposed to get justice is crooked. Even in Jesus' day. That they had partiality based on your condition. And oh, I know you don't think there's partiality in the judges system, but there is a great level of partiality. There is a great level of distinction between those who have and those who do not. And this widow finds herself in the midst of being taken advantage of. Now that's interesting that Jesus highlights this, that she's a widow and she's going to the judge because someone took advantage of her. Not only did life make her in this situation, but now she's being taken advantage of by someone who had more authority. What, what do you do when you've been taken advantage of by someone who you trusted? No, she's a widow. So the person probably said, hey, hey, hey I, I can come help clean your house for you. I can do it. Just give me 5000 and I'll take care of it. And you being an innocent, gullible widow just says, well, you know, thank God for you. I, I've been looking for somebody to help me. And, and you finally were kind enough to help me. And they took the money and never came and did the work. And, and her life is in bad shape, which simply just lets us know that life can get worse. God doesn't hide that from us. I know some of you think that when you got saved, life was going to get better. And for some of us, it did get better, but in other areas, it got worse. God doesn't hide that. He's, he's letting us know right in the open, this widow has it bad. She's poor, and the little money she had, someone took advantage, which, which tells you, you need to keep your head on a swivel. Because people will take advantage of you if they see your meat to be taken advantage of. Don't, don't think your vulnerabilities make you not susceptible to be taken advantage of. Man, I just, I'm just struggling right now. Oh, you struggling? Are you struggling? So what you willing to do to, for me to help you get out of the situation you're in? You know how people will take your weakness and seize it for their opportunity. Oh, this widow woman got it bad. She, she went to the judge, and she's asking the judge, and the judge is telling her, I ain't got no time to deal with you. What do you do when the people who you need to hear you don't want to hear you? When the people you, you want, I just want to be heard. You don't have to do anything, but at least listen to my side. And they didn't even want, because life is that way, where the people that need to hear you will not give you what you deserve. She is not getting what she deserves. You need to know. You need to let your children know. You won't always get what you deserve. I know some of us like to have our kids cry and mama and daddy will run out and try to dry their eyes, but you need to let them know sometimes you're going to cry and mama and daddy will not be there to rescue you. Neither will anybody else. I know you want to get a sympathy card from everybody. Okay, let's just do this real quick. High five your neighbor and say, I see you. I see you. High five them real good. I see you. I see you. Okay, that's the only high five you're going to get. Sometimes you're going to need to learn how to high five yourself. Sometimes you're going to learn to understand that ain't no Nobody going to give you a high five. No one's going to pat you on the back. This is what life is. Sometimes life will take advantage of you. 
And I know you want a pity party. I know, I know you want somebody to tell you, you know, you deserve more. You deserve to get more. But sometimes they will just take advantage of you because you're just meat for the game. It's survival of the fittest. It's dog eat dog. And this widow woman is experiencing what life is about. But Jesus says, well, men ought to always pray. And I know what you're thinking right now is you're thinking, well, Pastor, I, I heard this prayer thing. I know you said that widows can pray, so, so I'm included in this prayer. But here's my challenge, PD. I prayed and God didn't answer me. That's a real feeling. How many of you prayed for something God didn't answer? Like, you prayed, you fasted, you decided to turn over your plate, and God didn't answer you. Let me tell you that oftentimes we've taught prayer wrong. We teach people that prayer is the way to get God to move on your behalf. Sometimes God moves on our behalf. Sometimes he moves on our behalf by not giving us what we ask. Okay, now, now it's easy to preach and say, if you pray tomorrow, God's going to open up a window of heaven. And then you start praying and you pray for mama and mama is sick in the hospital and mama is dying. And you pray that God give her life and then all of a sudden she dies and now prayer don't work. Because that's a real emotion. But let me give you a perspective or a thought. If mama's dying, daddy's dying. And daddy's made up in his mind that he don't want to stay. But you're praying they stay. Is God wrong for honoring their desire over your intercessory desire? Does that make sense? Now, I'm not saying that's the case all the time, but there are times where we don't know if a person in the hospital is saying, Lord, you can go ahead and take me. And I know you already, why would they want to leave me? Why would they want to walk away from someone like me? But the reality is, is that when people have lived a while, they've done seen it all, and who knows if they got a glimpse of what eternity looks like? Who knows if they got a glimpse of what the pearly gates look like? Who knows if they got a glimpse of what peace feels like? And they might be saying, you know what? I don't want to be back here. I'm I'm good where I'm at. We good over here. I'd rather go with God than not deal with the injustices of this world. So, what if you prayed for a job and God didn't give it to you because he knew the job was going to let you go when you made it an idol? Maybe, maybe prayer sometimes is not God doing what I want. Maybe God is getting me to trust that if it doesn't go my way, his way is better than the way that I want it. Okay, okay, all right, all right, this is 1115, so y'all can be, have you ever dated somebody? <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> my God, <coughs> my, my Lord. Have you ever, <coughs> yes, have you ever dated somebody? Let me get some water on now. Have you ever dated somebody and it's a high school reunion and you see them or you see them on Facebook for some of you MySpace, for some of you Black Planet way back and then you see them and you're like, thank God I didn't go down that direction. God knew. I am thank God that that heartbreak happened early because this is not what I was signing up for because sometimes what we want is not what we want. We think we want it until we get it. God has to allow life to show us that sometimes God's graciousness to us. Okay, so let me give you this. God answers prayer three ways. No. There's no maybe. There's wait. There's no. There's yes. And there's wait. Sometimes God makes us wait so that our character catches up to our request. So, so God, I want you to do this for me. God's like, yeah, I really want to do it for you, but I see that if I do it for you, you will end up losing yourself. So let me just let you wait, not because I'm punishing you, but because I'm making a promise to you that this time is not the best time for what you're desiring. And I've got a season for you over here because sometimes when we pray, we don't see anything happening and we think prayer doesn't work because I prayed, I ain't see God do nothing. But sometimes when we pray, God goes to the answer and starts 
starts working on the answer and doesn't always go to the prayer, but he goes to the answer. While you're sitting there mad, upset that God is working on the answer, you're missing that God is moving in your midst. So he says, men, men ought to always, they need to always pray. And, and, and this woman, she kept coming to God. And because she kept coming to God, the judge, the judge was like, listen, I really don't want to deal with this person, but because they keep coming, they are wearing me down. And the word that is used is that she, she is giving them a boxing jab. She's punching them underneath the eye. She's giving them one punch to the eye. Every time she comes, she's giving a punch, which simply means that every time you pray, you're making an impact. But if any of you have ever fought before, you know that sometimes one punch won't knock somebody out. Sometimes you gotta keep swinging until you see something. Sometimes you gotta keep punching until you see something. And every time you and I pray, we're making a dent into something. And if your life looks like it's really bad, it's a good time to pray. If your life looks really good, it's a good time to pray. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of times we think prayer is only the vehicle that we need to use when life is bad. Sometimes you need to pray that it stays the way it is. That Lord, I know, I know, I know, it's an underrated blessing. Being able to wake up and be in your right mind, that's an underrated blessing. Being able to move your legs and move your arms and not be hooked up to a ventilator, that's an underrated blessing. Sometimes you need to just wake up and say, Lord, just keep me where I am. I know I'm praying for advancement, but keep my health the way it is because, God, it could get so much worse. But thank you for allowing me to be in my right mind in this space. So sometimes... Prayer is a vehicle to be used to keep us to this space. And, and God is forever listening. God is forever listening. He's forever listening. He's forever listening. You could have just came from the club last night. He's forever listening. You could have been drunk the night before and decided, I want to get myself, go to church, because I don't want to be a hypocrite. Let me back up and help some of you that keep saying, well, I don't want to go to church because I don't want to be a hypocrite. I'm online because I don't want to be a hypocrite. You do realize everyone in this room is a hypocrite. You do understand the word hypocrite comes from a Greek word, which means actor. To some degree, all of us are acting. I don't care who you are in this room, because if I ask you how you're doing, you're going to say, I'm blessed and highly favored. You you lying, you mad, upset, you big mad. You ain't just mad, you big mad. But the reality is, is life has taught us how to act the part because that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to lift my hands. I'm, and sometimes you don't know where your help is going to come from. But we act where we feel the response won't change the situation. So we feel, why should I open up myself to you and you don't really even care? So rather than tell you how I really am, I'm just going to tell you, I'm okay. But prayer, he says, is God's weapon that he gives to you and I. Now, now this text also is talking about the return of Jesus saying that we have to keep praying even if it looks evil. We have to keep praying even if it looks dark. I know it looks like the God is losing and it looks like God is being defeated. But here's what you and I need to recognize. God doesn't have a rival. Which simply means nobody, no enemy, no angel, no demon, no devil is God's enemy. They're not a rival to God. When I say not, they're, they're an enemy to God, but they're not a rival. They're not an equal to God. God recognizes I don't have a rival that can stand in my place. There's no, it's not, a lot of times we're like, oh my God, the devil's going to do this. God's like, why do we give so much credit and fear to someone inferior? You need to be more afraid of the creator than the creation. So maybe your prayers would change and you would start saying, man, the devil's busy. No, God is also busy. And if God is busy, the devil can't be busier than God. If God decides to change a thing. So here's the thing. Prayer centers us. Now here's some practical things I think is important. If you don't schedule when to pray, you'll never do it. 
Now, I don't want to schedule my time with prayer because if I schedule my time, it feels... No, if you don't schedule it, you'll never have it. You'll never develop what you don't give attention to. So I want to give you a homework assignment, like tell me your three times. Not verbally, but just w when's your three times? I mean, j I mean, Muslims pray five. You think Christians should at least pray three? L let, me, let me get you out of the religious field. You don't have to be on your knees to pray. You, you don't really see in scripture where people are on their knees praying. They just pray. Church has made prayer this whole different thing. You could be laying on your bed and praying. There's nowhere that says you got to be on your knees and your eyes closed. The Bible actually tells you to watch and pray. So while you're praying, while you might be sitting there in the shower praying, and some of you have limited your prayer to certain locations, and God's like, why are you limiting me like that? If you want to talk to me in the gym, talk to me. If you want to talk to me in the sauna, talk to me. If you want to talk to me on the toilet, talk to me. If you want to talk to me in the kitchen, talk. don't limit to where you can communicate with me. I'm a God that's everywhere at all times. I'm omniscient, omnipresent. Wherever you want me, that's where I'll be. God says, if you make your bed in hell, I'll be right there with you. Why? Because there's no restrictions to where God can meet us. So if you're a walker and you want to walk and pray, then you walk and pray. If you want to go by the ocean and pray because you're a nature person. And here, oh, let me back up and say this. Some of us like to pray by nature. That doesn't mean you worship nature. That simply means you acknowledge that God is in nature. And I connect with God in nature because that's where God is. God is in the tree. I'm not worshiping the tree. I'm acknowledging that this takes on the likeness of God. That it has the authority that God's spoken into the earth. And some of us like praying by water. It doesn't mean that we're worshiping water. It simply means that this is where I feel connected to my creator. When I look out into the seas and I see its infinite power and I see that that God by one word told it not to come too far to the shore. It lets me know when I see the seagulls fly over my head, it lets me know if that God would look after the seagulls, how much more would he look after his own children? And so you got to understand that we're not supposed to worship crystals. I understand that God can use things, but the things ain't God. So, so now here, let me hurry up. So now here's the thing that I think is critical. This text teaches us something that I don't hear much taught on because we want to push a passive Christianity that makes us feel good. This text says clearly that I will avenge and I will avenge speedily. And I will look after my elect, which is God's precious term that he uses towards his own people that if someone does you wrong and the widow is not in this situation because something she did she's in this situation because someone decided to take advantage of her and she decided to go to a judge that's more powerful than her and God says if this wicked judge would look after her how much more will I look after my own children some of us need to understand that God is not just a defensive God God is also offensive that God does not like anyone messing with his children he can't cares about his child. I know you think if I go to the voodoo doctor, if I go to the witch doctor, they, they have more interest in harming people than God does in preserving his own. You got it all twisted. Have you read the Psalms where David says, Lord, knock the teeth of my enemies out? If you read the Psalms, you're like, should this even be in my Bible? Because God is a warring God. He is a warrior God. God don't play about me. You can put your mouth on me if you want to. God don't play about me. You better get an attitude if God looked after a widow, God's certainly going to look after you. And God is an avenger. I know you love the movie, The Avengers, but there was an avenger way before that that is a God that is a God that is a God of war. That he says that those that do you wrong, you don't got to worry about that. I will take them on for you, and you don't have to fight them. You just need to turn them over to me. And when I fight them, I fight them better than anyone that can fight you. The Bible says, 
says that the Lord, when he fights, stand still, Exodus 14, verse 14, and see the salvation. I am the Lord your God. I will fight your battles for you. What does that mean? God ain't just listening to your prayers. God is hearing those that took advantage of you, that took, violated you, and God knows their name just like you do. And he says, if you give them over to me, I will fight your enemies. We live in a faith that is so afraid to see a God defending. God is clear. I defend my elect. And even he says in the text, he says, when I return, I will fully repay everyone for the evil that they have done by my righteous judgment. You do know God is going to be a judge and he is going to give judgment. So don't let anybody play you because we are living in a culture that reverences demonic activity so much. Man, I'm just going to go pay this doctor to do this. I'm just going to go pay this person to do this. When they don't recognize you got protection in God. You got authority in God. You got the greatest defense mechanism in the world. You got the greatest creator and defender in the world. It don't matter what they say about you, what they try to do to you. The Bible is clearly that no weapon that is formed against you shall be able to prosper. Because when you get that in your soul, you don't start begging other people for protection when you know that God is your defense now. I'm not saying be crazy and say, I'm not going to lock my door because God is defending me. I'm, I'm going to go walk in the middle of I-4 because God is defending me. But, but here's, here's, here's what God says. He says, I will defend you and the judge will accelerate. Like we, we, we need to raise a generation that understands God is a warring God. Like he would send his servants out to battle and he said, I will go ahead of you. It's almost like in this New Testament because we feel that Jesus died on the cross. When he died on the cross, we feel that forgiveness means absolving people from what they have done. Forgiveness is not for them. It's for you. It is to say, I'm going to release you from what you've done and I'm going to turn it over to God. Now, what we want is when we say, PD, I want God to repay them. You want God to break their legs in front of you, break their arms in front of you, and they walk around talking about, oh, the Lord done got me, the Lord done got me. No, sometimes the way God repays people is God allows them to stay alive long enough to watch you eat. Y'all just missed what I said. That God allows you to stay alive long enough so they can see. I thought that was going to take them out. I thought that was going to kill them. I thought that was going to ruin their marriage. And they're still standing and they're still going to church and they're still praising God and they're still worshiping and they're still honoring God. And the scripture says that he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, which simply means that God is going to let you live long enough and let your adversaries live long enough to watch you work and to watch God do whatever he said he was going to do over your life. God said, I'm going to prepare a table. What they fail to understand is you can't starve who God determined to feed. You, you can cut doors, but God can make a way where there seems to be no way. You can cut opportunities, but God will create new opportunities. You can sabotage my name. God will raise up people that need to know me. Because when God wants to get things done in my life, there's no one that can stop it. There's, so stop your crying, because if that door closed, God got another door. He got a better door. And what you need to learn how to do is praise him in the middle of the hallway and say, I don't know what's going to happen, but if there's no door, that means there's going to be another door that's greater than the door that I'm crying over because God will never lead me somewhere not to bring me all the way in. Now, again, as we close, because we got to get y'all out on time to get some breakfast, past lunch brunch. When, when we create times to commune with God, we set things in motion that we're not aware of.
So don't minimize your superpower. And don't turn your superpower over to somebody else. I ain't waiting for no pastor to pray for me. You crazy? And I'm a pastor. I'm not waiting for no chief intercessor to pray for me. No, because ain't nobody going to pray for me like me. Ain't nobody going to pray for your kids like you're going to pray for your kids. Trust me. I don't care how anointed they are. You, you know, an intercessor may give your kids 10 minutes, but you're going to give your kids 10 hours. And so I can't outsource praying for myself. I can't delegate. That doesn't mean I don't need prayer because I need all of it. But I cannot depend on other people to pray for me like I would pray for myself. Because only you know what you've been through. Only you know what you're dealing with. And only you know what you're walking through. Now, let me help you, because we got a little more time. You got to believe that God actually wants to hear from you. Because what you and I have done in Christian spaces, we give prayer over to the people who we think are super spiritual, and that doesn't include me. And God is pretty clear in this text. He didn't use a priest. He didn't use a prophet. He used a widow, the least of the least. So here, here's what we're going to do because we're, we're 11, 15. We got a little bit more time. Y'all knew church. We're going to be a little longer than 10, 9, 15. So, so I, I want to give, give you two minutes. I want you to practice because you don't look. So in my mixed martial arts class, what we learn is we, we learn how to do it. We learn how to do it. And then they say, go ahead and do it. And, but, 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 but wait, 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 wait. You want me to fight him? I'm not ready. No, no, no. You may not be ready, but you're going to get ready. Because what's going to happen is eventually the more you do it, your body's going to remember what you did. So I don't want you to just come to church and hear about it. I want you to hear about it and do it. So, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you pair up with two people, and we're going to take two minutes. It's not going to be two hours because I'm getting hungry. I'm going to tie to you, you tie to me, whatever the case is, whatever the case is. So, so I want you to pair up with two people, two people. All you need is two. Let's make it four so it don't feel odd. Let's make it four because you're like, I don't know that person like that. So let, let's make it four. Let's do a communal exercise. Let's make it four. Four, four people. Even you in the balcony, all y'all that sit up in the balcony because y'all don't want to talk to people. I, I know you too. All right, so four, four, four. I need, okay, that means you stand, stand. I need you to find four people. And, and don't, don't go too far. I'll just find it in your if you're sitting by each other, you're my four. If you're sitting by me, we're our four. If you're sitting by me, you're my four. You're my four. You're my four. You're my four. At four. Not 18, four. 11, 15, y'all, y'all kind of. All right, if you're looking mean, we want you to find somebody. Don't look mean so people don't talk to you like, man, I'm not, I'm not looking at them. I'm just gonna look mean so no one talk to me, man. I'm look mean. We got we got two, we got two minutes. Two minutes, two minutes. And all, all, all you need to do is tell me what you're praying for. All you need to do is say, say whatever, money, finances, family, whatever. Just four minutes. T two minutes. Ready? Right? I'm going to give you. So a a ask them, all right, what, what is it? Okay, cool. Marriage. All I need you to do is talk to God. You ain't got to be deep. You ain't got to be loud. Just do it. That's all I need you to do. One, two, three, pray. Come on. Come on, y'all. Father, we ask you to do it in the name of Jesus. Father, change, transform, renew, restore, bless, increase in the name of Jesus. So, Father, we ask you to do what only you can do. Move on their hearts as only you can move. As you spoke to the widow woman and said, I want you to pray and not fail. I want you to not get exhausted from doing this. I don't want you to minimize this. I want you to keep this ingredient in your heart, in your mind. Wake up in the morning and give me this. Wake up in the evening and give me this. In the name of Jesus, we pray. So, Father, we pray that you would do it in the name of Jesus. We ask that you'll touch my neighbor from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. We ask that you'll do some amazing things in their life. 
We ask that you do some amazing things in their life in the name of Jesus. We ask that you will touch them in every aspect. Touch their family, touch their children. We pray, God, that you'll protect them from evil. We pray that you'll protect them from all types of sickness and disease. And Father, we know that you love them. We know that you care for them. And we ask you, Father, that you'll do incredible things in their life. We pray that they'll have more confidence to pray to you. That they will not feel that they are not worthy enough to pray to you. But God, they will trust that you desire to hear from them. That you desire to hear from them. And so, Lord, I pray that you would begin to stir up in their heart to know that, God, I'm called by you. If, God, you want to hear from a widow, you'd want to hear from me. And so I trust that you would depend upon me to lift up my voice for my children, lift up my voice for my spouse. I ask you now, Father, that you would be a good God to me. You are faithful, God. You look after your own. And so, Lord, I pray that the weapons that have been formed against me shall not prosper. That, God, you would raise up intercessors. You would raise up those that are trying to fight against me. And you would fight against them in the name of Jesus. Twenty seconds. You believe that somebody clap your hands like you believe. Come on, clap your hands like you believe. Come on, clap those hands like you believe. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord, if you know you're redeemed. So listen. You, you, can, you can start changing your atmosphere by creating it. God has given you the power to do it. Don't delegate it. Don't outsource it. Don't give it to somebody else. You're the widow that God wants to hear from. And a widow don't have much. That don't mean you have to have a lot to come to him. You just got to come. It don't matter if you ain't came to him in three weeks. All you got to do is come. If you're here and you're saying, PD, I'm not saved, I'm not right with God, man, I, I, I need to get right. I want you to, I want to pray with you. I want you to come. That's all you got to do. If that's you, wave at me. PD, I want to, I want to get saved today. Like, I want to get right today. I just need you to wave at me. Five seconds, we're praying. I want to include you in. PD, that's me. I want to get right today. I don't want to wait. I want to get right today. Wave at me. I want to pray with you. I want to include you in. I want you to be right with God before this service is over. Five seconds. If our hearts and minds are clear, two things. If our hearts and minds are clear, one, if our hearts and minds are clear, our job now is to invite each and every person we have more space. 915 has way more space. 1115 has more space. We're not like 1010. So we have the opportunity to invite more people who need to reconnect with God. We need to get people who need to be found and bring them. You know, they say one invite from somebody, they'll accept to come to church. And you are the inviter. So every empty seat is an opportunity to be invited. I want us to prepare now to give generously to God in obedience to him, whether you want to sit in whatever. Um, on our screens are, are various ways to give. So notice the cash app handle has changed to TKC Orlando West. That's our newest handle. I know some of you are used to using the old handle. We're, we're fading that out. You can still use it, but it's going to be faded out within the next two to three weeks. So what I want everyone to do in this moment is to prepare you're not going to pay your tithes because tithes is not a bill. When we say I'm paying my tithes, God ain't no bill. 
be not O-U-C, AT&T. The proper language is I'm returning my tithe. I'm returning. What's returning my tithe? My tithe is 10%. Why 10%? That's just the number God said. I didn't set it. It don't go up next year because inflation now tithe is 11%. Tithe is 10%. And I want to challenge you to prioritize God in your giving. Your offering is a free will gift that you give unto God. This week, we'll be signing, hopefully, once our attorneys get it done, we'll be signing the agreement for these tiny homes that we are going to bring on our property that's going to hose, house, it's going to house families for a certain period of time until they get on their feet. We used to have an empowerment home on our other campus, which we had four families living there. They paid rent at the end of the six months. They went through credit class, budgeting class, finance class, taught them how to buy a house. Out of the four families, two were able to purchase a home. So we're trying to bring that same space to this campus, which we will sign the agreement this week, assuming that our attorneys turn it over and then we'll put our deposit down and then to transport these homes is about $6,500 just to transport them. And then we got to finish by uh, hooking up electrical, hooking up sewer, and, and all those different factors. So it's not going to be, when you see them here, it's not going to be in 10 minutes. It's going to be up and running. It's a project. But the first step of the project is securing the asset and then bringing the asset here. So whether you're online or in this space, we're asking you to participate with us in being generous. Generosity is not tipping. It's what can I give that can make a significant contribution to what the church is doing this week. And that's what we do. Whether it is someone is shot, killed, they call the church, they need a space to use. The church pays for, not the funeral, but the church pays for all of the sound people to come in, all of the facility costs. We cover it all so that they can just enjoy the generosity of people who did something in this moment. Now, we don't advertise, hey, if you get killed, go to TKC because we're doing it for free. That's not what we do, but that is a thing that we have done. And so how do we make the difference this past week, we walked over to a school because it's the end of the year. They're doing their outreaches for all of the high honor roll students. They're doing an award piece for them, and they didn't have the money, which is an interesting phenomenon that happens in inner city schools. They don't have the resources. We paid for the entire program so all of the kids can have bounce houses, food, and have a great time for the end of the year graduation. We paid for it. We paid for it. We wrote the check, went to the school, delivered it to the principal. But it's, it's, it's moments like these that make the difference. No one, no one can say that the church is not impactful because they see what we do. But it's not just, when we take these tiny homes and bring them here, and one, if you've never been to a tiny home, you'll, this will be your first opportunity to see what a tiny home looks like. So you'll get to actually experience what a tiny home feels like. It's real, it's small, but there's a new fad that people are, are doing, tiny homes. The other home is not tiny. It's about 450 square feet. So we're able to do that. It's an extension of the ministry that we have to do here. Some churches don't have to do that because that's not a challenge that they have in their communal context. But we see that there are people who end up on hard times who are maybe no fault of their own. They're like the widow. They they trusted somebody and then it took their finances out of control and now rent is due and they don't have the money and now they're finding themselves being evicted and now an eviction on your credit doesn't allow you to rent other houses and then it's just a whole spiral. But if somebody can come to the church and say, hey, I'm not trying to live here, but can you let me stay for two weeks and we have the space to do that? Like what type of power of showing people love is that. It's greater than any sermon that's been ever preached. It's more impactful. So I'm asking your generosity to do that with us. Uh, we're partnering with some business community folks to help us do that. And maybe you're an entrepreneur and you're like, hey, I, I wanna write some money off for this. Um, we'll tell you how to do that. It's under our other not-for-profit, which is Recover Orlando. Um, so some people have 
challenges given to a church and we have businesses that can give towards to that. So if you know a business that's, that's like, hey, I'd love to support great causes, that's a great cause and they don't have to give to a church, they can give to a not-for-profit that is a company. But in this moment, you, that's what your giving does. And if you skip this moment, you don't just affect your opportunity to receive, you also affect our opportunity to reach. So there's two things happening. You're receiving because you're giving, but you're also helping us reach because you give. So let me pray over our giving as we do this. Father, thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you for blessing us to give. Giving is a relational thing, and we give because you blessed us to give. So now multiply that which has been given, cause it to be used for the advancement of your house, and we thank you in advance because you've blessed us to give. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers are coming to receive. Elder Clinton's closing out the service. Please do not depart. It's only going to be a couple minutes. We just need you to sit where you are. Let them do their work so that they can do it. God bless you. See you Sunday morning. Bring a friend with you. You've been deputized. Let's invite, invite, invite. Let's give a hand for the word this morning. First time visitors this morning, can you please stand now for your first time visit here at the Kingdom Church? We want to thank you so much for being here this morning. Come on, let's give a hand for our welcome. Our guests are here this morning. They could have chose any church in Orlando, but they came to the Kingdom Church this morning. Now we want we have a special presentation for you. It's gonna take about two to three minutes. I want you to follow our ushers here. You can follow them now. Can you please, you can bring your belongings and you can follow our ushers. We have a special presentation. If you came with somebody, they can come with you too. Can you please, let's give a hand for our guests this morning. I'm going to have everybody stand this morning, this afternoon. Lord, I just thank you for being the father that you are. I pray that we have a productive week this week, Lord. I pray that any weapon form against us shall not prosper, Lord. I pray that we'll walk out in authority and do everything that you called us to do this week. We thank you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You have a great week.